I'm Thorny Staples. I'm the Director of Community Strategy and Alliances at DuraSpace and Director of the Fedora Project. I've been involved with Fedora for a very long time now, it seems. Um, Sandy Payette developed the Fedora architecture as part of a research project and published her first paper in 1998. I found that paper in 1999, got interested. I was doing digital library work at the University of Virginia. I contacted her, we got to be friends, and eventually we got a series of grants and created the Fedora software and then created the DuraSpace company, merging with the DSpace people last year. Um, and that's what brings us to where we are today. Um, I'm, this, this presentation is not intended to be a complete, in-depth, ultimate, all the details of Fedora kind of presentation. It's really intended to give people some the basics of, of what you need to understand Fedora to get started and to start looking more closely at the documentation. Um, so I'll, uh, that's the, the basic pitch here. Um, if, you, if, if you have a question about something I've said, it's not clear, please don't hesitate to speak up and ask. But if you've got a question that's more general, save it to the end, and I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, so we'll get started. Um, Fedora actually means something. It stands for the Flexible Extensible Digital Object Repository Architecture. And I think the basic way I look at it is a set of abstractions that can be used to represent different kinds of data for lots of different kinds of purposes. Um, the Fedora software that DuraSpace manages that we, you know, have, we um, are the catalyst for now. We have a community development process, but um, it is a complete repository management system, but it's not a complete information management system for your favorite use case. It, it gives you, the, essentially, it's a really powerful foundation for a whole variety of information management applications. And the basic purpose, of the basic thrust behind all of our development these 10 years has been to make software a repository that can be used to make data durable over the long term. We tend to use the term durable these days um, rather than talking about preservation because we, we think it means keeping preservation and access and we think that's a very important thing. So a lot of what I'll be telling you about is um, the, the characteristics of Fedora that were built into and designed to do that. Fedora can be used for purposes that aren't so durable. You can have all kinds of information management schemes that you may not care so much about long-term uh, management of the data, but it is the basic thrust of everything we've done is, is aimed at that, that use case, uh, that general, very general use case. Um, so, I mean, making complex digital information durable is a really hard problem. When I say complex digital information, we tend to look at, at digital information as being developing, developing along a trajectory where we're going to have the World Wide Web of formally defined content, meaning digital objects that have lots of relationships to other digital objects. And the real meaning of the digital information, the purpose of it, will be much more about putting things together and, and very complex arrays of information that must be uh, maintained and managed over time. So part of the problem is assuring the fidelity of the information, and that's standing behind the existence and the meaning of the content, that you have to verify that the bits are still the same bits that were put in. But that's only true until you start migrating data, which we already are doing and we will be doing lots more of, migrating to new formats, migrating to you know higher resolutions, uh, re, you know, rescanning, that kind of thing. So the idea is it's keeping both the fidelity and the authenticity of the information as stable as possible over time. So there's a, a part of repository management of digital information that's about that authenticity question. It's about being able to say that this content is logically the same content that it was, even if all the bits are changed. And where the bits haven't changed, you can prove the bits haven't changed. So a lot of that has storing metadata about the events that are happening to the data. Fedora gives you ways to do both things built in, and we'll look at that more in a moment. Um, another important thing here is that when you're talking about complex information, the context of it, the, the relationships it has to other digital information is critical. And so it's not a simple matter of just having a bunch of relatively simple digital objects and keeping them in a line. It gets much more complex than that. So having the flexibility to represent very complex arrays of objects that have all kinds of different relationships and more than one relationship, many relationships in some cases, 
is is really critical to the what we're building on the web, I believe. Um, so, and increasingly, these complex resources will not be in a single repository. So, if you are designing your repository with the idea that it's a closed repository, that as long as you have all your objects under your control and you do nice things with them, you're okay, I think that's not going to go very far because a big part of the purpose of putting things in repositories is so people can use them, and people don't care which repository they're in. They want to go out and find things and put them together in new ways, create new scholarly, scientific, and all kinds of other materials. So having a, a system that's ready for that is a big part of what the whole Fedora project has been about since the beginning. And that's one reason we took the approach that we did. Um, so I think it's, it's safe to say, as I said in the beginning, the four Fedora abstract it's a set of abstractions about digital data that you can use to build this durability framework. So the basic idea is the content is unitized as objects, information objects, that combine the data and metadata, policies about how the data and metadata can be used, relationships of that ob the object in, in, your, in question to other objects, and then all of the information about the history of the object, the, the metadata about the events, what we think of as preservation metadata. All of that is stored in an object where all the metadata about the content, all the different components of the content are in one object that then can have relationships to other ones. So then these complex digital relationships are all stored as objects that can have relationships asserted and you can, tr you can from any given object, you can travel the, the graph of relationships to, to use the, the complex information. Um, so Fedora provides two, really two kinds of abstractions. One abstraction is sort of the, what I like to think of as the front-facing abstraction, which is a, the view towards the application space, that this is how the content looks with all its complexity. And then there's the back-end sort of abstraction, which makes all of, the, all of the, the content look like a bunch of files. That's one of the really elegant things about Fedora. It's designed to be able to manage data as if it's just a bunch of files, flat files in an array, um, that then when you start using them, they start looking like a graph, a very complex graph related on it. So Fedora is like the, the um, software in the middle that sort of breaks the connection between those two sets of abstractions or maintains the connection between those two sets of abstractions. And, and Fedora is completely web services oriented, and that's part of um, was designed from the very beginning in Sandy and Carl's research. Carl Lugosi worked with it on Sandy in the beginning. Um, that was designed around the idea of, of federating repositories. So it was these, this idea that repositories were going to be sharing data, people were going to be using data across repositories was there from the beginning. And it's been, it's going to become more and more critical. Um, this picture is, is designed to kind of show you where Fedora fits in. Those, those purplish blue boxes on the top, think of that as that's the application space. And so I just put some examples here. Um, I included DSpace because we're, we're talking about and he's talking about, you know, the part of the purpose of this presentation was to help them understand Fedora so they can think about a new version of DSpace that puts Fedora inside. We also now have a couple of very powerful applications out there from the Fedora community, Islandora and Hydra, um, and then Black Light was a, an example of a solar-based um, indexing system that can be build powerful search indexes, um, searching systems on top of Fedora. So the idea is Fedora is like this foundation. It's sitting back there as a repository. And I'm start, I've started over the last few years to really think about the repository as the top of the infrastructure, not the bottom of the application space. So if you think of your disk space and your servers, then the repository like the top layer of that infrastructure. And then you build out all the different kinds of um, applications that you want to use the data for, that Fedora stores for different purposes, different use cases. Ideally, these applications that people are building, and this is true of Blacklight, Islandora, and Hydra so far, these applications can share a single logical Fedora repository. They don't have to dominate the repository. They don't have to own the repository. This is a really important, um, really important idea, I think, because we want a repository to have different phases for different purposes, but then you want to hand off the, the management um, function to, to one set of people, potentially, no matter how many different ideas and use cases are going on above it. 
So that's the top part of this picture. And so that, that front-facing abstraction is all about what those applications see when they look at Fedora. On the back end, Fedora stores everything as files. If it actually stores it, it may just relate to it. So you see over on the those orange boxes, the one on the left, um, it signifies Fedora's capability of having data streams in an object be anywhere in web addressable space and not under the management of the repository, but they can participate in an object that, that Fedora manages. Um, generally, what people think about when they think about a repository is managed content, where the repository actually gets the copy of the, of the data, which becomes the, the, the main copy, and puts it in its own disk space. Increasingly, so this, this is the other abstraction, and we call them data streams in an object that are about files that are in the file space. Fedora was built from the beginning with a really pretty simple idea of the back end. It was just a logical file system. Um, lots of files out there, and then and um, Fedora just managed them in, as objects. Well, increasingly, the back end behind Fedora is getting more and more interesting, more and more complex. Um, our DuraCloud, um, DuraSpace's DuraCloud product that we're working on now, um, that's I think version 7 to point seven is about to come out, um, that's all about having a file space in the back end that you can start replicating files. So that already, we've already been working on plugging that into the back end of Fedora. So what that means is your Fedora is looking at the files as logical, one copy of the file that that is what it is and it's maintaining, and then DuraCloud can replicate it in the back end and make multiple copies. I tend to think this is the first step along the way towards pushing that preservation, those preservation activities into the back background, down below the surface. So the, the data is already being used in extremely complex ways. When you start adding all the different preservation copies and trying to keep track of it all, it's much more complex. If we could push that stuff down below the surface, I think we'd be much better off. Um, what's in version 4.0 of Fedora, which is planned, that back end is going to get even more interesting. The high-level storage project it's called, which the committers are, are just beginning to work on, um, is all about having much richer and more elaborate back end um, file systems so that can do all kinds of things. So I'm not going to get into that too much, but I'll point you to a place you can read about it at the end. Anyway, this is the idea that Fedora is the sort of the abstract data management layer between the application space and the file storage. Okay, so the basic idea behind Fedora is there are digital objects. Think of a, a, a data object. There are four kinds of objects. Data is the main one. Um, data objects are there to represent one unit of content. And you can represent any way you want. Fedora gives you a set of, of buckets, essentially, that you put data in that you can together in one object. And it's up to you. Your architecture for how you use your repository is all about designing your object to match the data the way you want to use the data. So the idea here is that for it, it is a FoxMole file, which is Fedora Object XML. It's um, an XML schema that expresses the Fedora concepts for an object directly. And all of the content about objects in the Fedora repository are stored in FoxMole files. So every single object, all of the data that we're going to be talking about, none of it lives in a database that needs to be sustained. It's all in the in the Foxmole files or the content files. They're left as files in the file system too. Um, and then the Foxmole file organizes them, if you will, and, and stores all of the metadata, all the checksums, all the other things that Fedora manages. They're all stored in that XML file. So in the XML file, there are what we call data streams. And so a data stream, think of it as just a component of the object. Um, uh, and so a Fedora object is made up of a set of data streams. The whole package has one persistent identifier, which is we refer to as the PID. And in the Fedora repository, the software um, maintains the um, uniqueness of those IDs. When you put an object in, if you try to put an object in with an ID that's already in there, it'll be rejected. And Fedora is pretty easy going about how you build those IDs. You can do them within certain limits, just about any way you want. It, we provide a, uh, an ID generator, a PID generator with Fedora that is relatively simple, starts with one, and never repeats a number with a prefix on the front. Um, but you can substitute your own PID generator. People have done a variety of things. But the idea is there's one PID that represents the, the unit of content. 
And within that unit of content, there can be many files. So looking at the picture, you can see the top set. There's a group of files that the repository maintains for every object. Some of these you have some access to, but most of them, mostly you don't. The repository writes them. So there's a, a Dublin Core, the DC data stream. It uses Dublin Core, but it was not intended to be your user Dublin Core metadata, not your discovery metadata. It was the simplest idea that we had for some metadata that the repository manager could use when they were managing the objects and looking at them and doing things with them. People often want to overload that and they think that's where they put their Dublin Core and really not. You should put it in your own custom data stream, but we'll get to that in a minute. So this one, the Fedora indexes that Dublin Core data. It'll create it if you don't with some real minimal fields and then it gives, there's a built-in basic search that lets you search through it. That search was intended for repository managers, not for the public. Um, so we'll get to the way that the searching was intended to be towards the end of this. Um, so there's RHEL's X, which is external relationships. I was talking about how you have object-to-object -object relationships. This is where they're intended to be. So these are RDF expressions of object relationships that all say, my, this object, my PID, has this relationship to this other PID. So it's how you, the object asserts those relationships. So all of the relationship data about object-to-object -object relationships are contained in those Foxmill files as well. So when those files are, are sustained on disk, all of that data is still there in those flat files. There's also an audit trail in a, in a data stream that the, op, the repository maintains. And that's just a list of all the actions that have, all the um, API actions that have happened to that, uh, that object. There's also policies, and, and policies, um, you, can, you can put policies in an object, um, attach policies to an object, and we'll talk a little more about this later. But these are that are about the use of the object or, or the connection of the object to other processes. There's a whole variety of things. But generally, when people are getting started, they think of policies as access control policies. There's a whole variety of other things you could do with them, but that's the main idea. But those can be stored with the object itself. And then there are custom data streams, and you can have any number of them, and there's a bunch of different types which we'll talk about in a minute. But these are the components of the content of the object. These are what make up what you consider different parts of a single unit of content. So these may be, in your mind, content data streams and metadata data streams, but your metadata about your content. Okay, And you can put anything you want in there um, generally, it's, it's a reference to a file somewhere else, and we'll talk about the different types of data streams in a minute. But the basic idea is your architecture of the way you use Fedora is building the patterns of, of data streams and the objects that you build. Um, so for each object, there's a set of properties that are, are either maintained by Fedora or you can put stuff in. Um, so again, there's the PID, which is the formal identifier for that object. There's an object type. As I said, there were actually there are four object types. Now this is a little old. There's the data object that we've been talking about. And then there are two service objects that are about having Fedora have disseminations associated with the data object. And there's also, as of Fedora 3.0, there's a content model object, which we'll talk about more in a minute. We'll talk about those other kinds. Every object, the repository maintains the created date and the last modified date on the object. You can see that format there. Um, the state of the object, we have active, inactive, deleted, and there's also another state that's not listed here that's purge. So the idea, um, we had a lot of arguments in the early days of Fedora about whether you ever really purge an object or not once you put it in, and there are a lot of people that wanted to. So when we have a deleted state, that means it's not going to participate in any of the activities, but it stays there until it's marked purge and you run a purge process to clean it out. So it lets you mark it deleted without actually getting rid of it. It just won't be used anywhere. You have a label for the object that you can put any string you want. There's the content model, which is actually that this is I'm sorry, this is I didn't update this, I forgot to do this. This is now the content model is reflected in the oh, I think there's I think this gives you the name of the content model, but the actual content model the association is in the Rails X data stream now. And then the owner ID um, you, you don't necessarily want, always want the super user, say, of the, of the repository to be the owner. A lot of, there's a lot of configurations where, like, say you have, you're supporting faculty 
in activity in their repository. They're building their their own stuff. You might want them to be the owner of their content, having all owner rights. So that's why that's in here. So these are all object by object um, um, properties. All right, and then these are the types of data streams that can be in a single object. As I mentioned, they're different kinds. So managed content is that, that basic kind you think about when you think about a repository. When you create the Fedora object, every data stream that in the object you're ingesting that's marked as managed, it'll use the URI it's given, and it'll go and get the file, and it'll write it to Fedora's managed content area, its own private file space where it keeps track of all the files. Um, there's external data streams, and those, when you give the URL to make the object for the data stream, it doesn't go and get the file. It just stores the URL in the Foxmo file in the object. And then every time you refer to that object, it actually uses the URL to go and get it. Um, so that kind of, that kind of objects with external data streams, the data is not under the management of the, of the repository, but you have things like like checksums and that kind of stuff that you can tell if it's the same, if it's changed at all, you just don't manage it. There are whole repositories that people have built that are nothing but, or almost all external relationships that are semantic overlays, sort of on, on resources that are out there on the web, just to add a new layer of interpretation to them. Um, so it can be very useful. Um, external redirected is like external, except in this case, you actually, um, take the PID of the object and you give it back to the client, the requesting process. So like in a web page, it, it will use the ID. These are in there so that you can do things like video uh, streaming, which are very difficult to do through the first two types. Where a lot of that managed, uh, that high level storage work that we were, I was talking about earlier, will be aimed at being able to get rid of this so you can have some of those processes that now are difficult to do in, in in data streams that the user does never sees the uh, the ID. The main idea, the idea behind these data streams, is that the user never gets the, the actual URL of the content. They just get the the Fedora identifier. Um, but that external redirected, they do. And then there's inline XML, which is where you have XML data that's actually stored directly in the Foxmore file. And these People are often tempted to put all of their metadata in these inline XML files and put them in the Foxmo file. But the Foxmo file, if it grows too much, it affects performance. So you really don't want to do that very much. It's there for very specialized things. Um, so, you know, you have to read more in the documentation about how that, that works. But you want to be very careful about using this. You want your, your Fedora uh, Foxmo files to stay between about 20 and 50K. Um, so some people have gone in and put metadata with huge text fields and <laughs> performance really slows down. So don't want to use that one too much. All right. I'm hitting the wrong key here. Okay, so for each data stream, there's a whole set of properties, and this is where some of the durability information comes in. So every ID has a has every every data stream has its own unique ID that's unique within that object. I mean it has a checksum. Fedora provides checksums. It's turned on by default. You can actually turn it off. And you can, con in the configuration process, you can define different types of checksums that you want to create. Um, there is a default, but I, I frankly can't remember it right now. But it is configurable. And you can plug your own in fairly easily if you want to. Um, the mind type of the data stream is a critical piece of information that the repository captures when it comes in. And again, the create date and last modified dates are all kept on the object. Um, there's a state on the object also, and whether the on, on the data stream whether it's um, active, inactive, or deleted. There's a control group, and that's where the um, that the four kinds of data stream. That's where that's reflected about what type data stream this is um, that I just talked about. There's um, versionable, and you can by default when you create an object, versionable is set to true, which means Fedora will every time a data stream gets updated, it creates a new version. Um, and you see down at the bottom of the picture, it's showing the version. So, the the the, the version of the of the data stream, the contents of the data stream that have the most recent um, date, are considered the current version, and everything else is an earlier version. So it's all done by date right now. Um, 
there's an optional format identifier. Which this is where if we ever get some good um, format registries, you can put the format identifier in there, like the uh, GF, GDFR and those some of those projects um, that people have been talking about. That some are finally getting going. I think this is where we can start to have something better than MIME types, but it's built in there so you can use it if you want to. And you can have a descriptive label on the data stream that's designed for more human eyes. So let's see, as I said, versions I already displayed. So let's move right along. So when you're creating objects, as I said, every object is an XML file, one of these FoxNet files. So there's different ways in the when you're building workflows around your Fedora repository to to put objects in there. There's different ways to do it. You can you can use the APIs and actually construct an object and add all the components to it as parts of the process. Um, a lot of people like to do that for you know critical important data that they want to have every single the 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 events for every single thing that happened to the object. It it can take a while. It can be pretty slow. It can also um, if you have versioning turned on, you're doing this. You generate a version every time you you change the object. The, the uh, object. So you, every time you're changing a data stream, adding a data stream, or changing something, you, you versioning can become a problem. But the other way to do it is you can create the boxable file in your workflow and then ingest it. So you can do. You can have a client that creates that does that sort of creating all the components of the object and assembling the boxable file and then just ingest it whole. You can also create a whole batch of those things, filling in all the information that we just looked at, and putting URIs for where to find the content files for each of the content data streams, the metadata data streams, in the Foxmo file. And then when you ingest it, Fedora takes looks at the Foxmo file, as I said, looks at the PID to make sure it's unique. If it is, it accepts the, the Foxmo file. Then it goes through every data stream and finds the URI URL for that content for the file. And depending on the type of data stream, it then either gets the file or leaves it where it is and stores the URL, or gets the file and puts it in as a as an inline file inside the Foxmo, and then it ingests it in. And as I said, you can do those both batch or single. Um, but but all of the all of the files are always identified. Files that Fedora Objects Manage are always identified as URLs. All right. So back to policies. So as I said, Fedora can can have policies associated with objects. It can have repository-wide policies that you can define a policy for any pattern of object that matches um, a particular um, expression. Um, that can be stored at the repository level. You can also have policies that are on at the object level, so a policy for any access to an object as a whole. You can also have policies expressed at the data stream level or at the method and the disseminator level. So the, the action that you are allowed to do with Fedora service objects, every different method in that can have a different policy associated with it as well. And those can be stored directly with the object. Um, so policies, we use ExactMole by default. Um, which is XACML, I forget what it stands for exactly, but it's an XML schema that expresses policy policy uh, rules expressions. And so policies are expressed as resources and then the rules that are applied to those resources. So the resources, as I said, can be objects or, or um, combinations of objects and dates, combination of objects and names, different kinds of patterns like that. It's, go and look at the documentation for all the details. The basic idea is you have a resource, and then you have rules that are applied to them. And a lot of this is about um, allow and deny, whether you allow access or deny access. But you can have policies that express things like, if the person who's calling, who's asking for this object, wants to see this view, and they have these, these credentials, you want to show them a, a, a bit of text on the screen that they have to click through to get to it. So that's not exactly an access. Policy, it's a it's a dependency kind of policy, so you can do all kinds of different things with those. But they are expressed as ExactMol, and and Fedora can, anything you can express in an ExactMol, Fedora can um, enforce with the built-in engine. I'm not going to get any more into security than that because it gets really complicated. I'll point you to places in the, in the documentation at the end that you can go find out more about it. The idea is is 
have all the policies very flexible and very fine grained. Um, so um, relationships among the objects are a really critical component of what makes the door interesting, I think. And this is that whole idea when you have the rel X data stream, you can assert RDF relationships uh, about this object and the type of relationship to some other object. And I'll get into some examples in a minute that start to make, maybe make some better sense of that, I hope. But the basic idea is that if you see down there in the second bullet, um, you have the PID and the formal type of relationship. So it's the subject of the, of the relationship, which is the PID of the object that you're talking about. And then you have a formal um, type of relationship that's expressed in, a, in an ontology. The door has a starter ontology that you can add to um, of kinds of relationships. And then you have the object of the relationship, so the, which object I mean object in the logical sense, but the actual Fedora object that it relates to. So you have the pit of the subject and the pit of the, of the um, object and then a, a, a formal identifier for the relationship. And then you can have any number of those in an object and they're stored in the rel text data stream. So they can be used to assemble aggregations of objects, complex ways of, of, of um, relationships among objects can be used to express things like you digitize a book and you may want to have all your page images be separate objects and then a book object and you can make a relationship that the book knows about all the pages. You can have, um, you can express collections of objects. So one interesting thing that we've done since pretty much since the beginning of Fedora is we have um, what we call an implicit, an implicit aggregation where you have an object that represents the collection. So there's an object that has some metadata in it that expresses what the, the meaning of a collection. And then you add, as you add child objects, you, the, each child object asserts that they are members of that collection by asserting a relationship that is member of relationship to that collection object. Then when you want to go and access the, the data, you can discover the collection object and then you can use that to go to an index and assemble a list of all the children. So in your workflow, when you're, when you're adding, say you've got your, your modern English collection of text, which is all the, your digitizing text in your library and it's all the English language text that you have, you can have one object that has the metadata about the collection that explains the collection, the reason that this library, this is so important to the library and what the bounds of the collection are and the size generally and that kind of stuff. And then every time you digitize a new book that's in that collection, you just assert the relationship in the books object and the next time the, um, someone assembles the collection, they find the one that you just added. You can have explicit aggregations where the, the parent object actually has a list of all the relationships to say this is a member of, this object is a member of, my is let's see is the child of uh, some other relationship I don't know that. but but basically it can go the other way or you can go actually both ways but but so you can have some kinds of aggregations that a user defines this set of things are a collection because I say they are and then the implicit one each of the objects just asserts that it's part of it both are pretty useful for lots of different things um, and as I said earlier over time. It's going to get really complex. Uh, watching what scholars do with digital information over the years, they want to discover things in all kinds of repositories, make new connections, make new digital stuff that's going to be given back to one of those repositories, and those relationships are going to be scattered across many repositories in some of these complex things. So this, what we've done is started down the road of a way to actually make sense of that process. Um, so if, if you've been around the Fedora uh, list at all, you've probably heard people talking about the compound versus atomistic content modeling. Um, so that's all about how you define your objects. As I said, you can have any number of data streams in one object. Um, or you can have relatively simple, you can have an object that has lots and lots of data streams, though that can become a problem for various reasons. Or you can have an object with very small numbers of data streams that relates to lots of other objects. So the, this is the, the slide that I'm using here. I just did an example. So um, if, you're, if you're scanning a document, a, t a document that's printed on paper and you want to put it in your repository, the ultimate compound approach to that is to say every page image plus the data about the, the, the document as a whole 
that is, because there is a text transcription, all of those are data streams in the same Fedora object. So for a five-page document where you have, say you have uh, your um, archival image from the scan plus you have a screen size that you're storing because you don't want to compute it on the fly and you have a thumbnail because you don't want to compute it on the fly, all three of those data streams times five pages, you've got 15 data streams. Then you have one or more data streams that are the document as a whole, maybe a PDF and maybe a transcription of the document. It starts to get pretty big. Um, for a book where you have 500 pages, it can get really messy. And so access to that kind of object means you have to negotiate the semantics of the whole text to get at each page image. Reusing those images outside the context of the document is kind of a problem. So there's a, the second sort of level, and this is where you start to get into what we originally called the atomistic model, is where you have each unit of content, and it's more art than science to define this. Um, so for a text, you have an object that has all the data streams that are about the text as a whole, the PDF and the transcription and say the, the uh, mods record that's the metadata about the text, all are data streams in the parent object. And then each image object, that each page that you scan has one object for all the image files associated with that scan and all the metadata about them. So that's still a little bit compound because you have more, you have content that has metadata about it put together in one object, and so some of the metadata is about one data stream, and some of it's about another, and there are different schemes that you can use to make sense of all that. Then you've got the, the ultimate, I guess, atomistic example is where every file that's considered to be a, a, a content file is a separate object, and metadata about it are the other data streams, but they're always separate objects, and then they're related. So your image objects might have a thumbnail, a thumbnail object, a uh, screen size object, and an um, archival image object, all related to the, the one object that represents the actual scan, the original scan, which is then related back to the parent. So all of these schemes have their, their uses. Um, and again, it's more art than science in deciding what, what, what you decide to do. But they all have their, they're the downsides and the upsides. And that's something that you have to <laughs> figure out for yourself as you're doing your repository. There's lots of people that have done it different ways that can give you opinions on how to work it. But Fedora lets you do it all those different ways. All right, so now getting into the behaviors, one of the things that attracted us to, a lot of us to Fedora in the first place is the fact that you could have behaviors associated with an object. Um, on top of all this abstraction of the data streams and stuff, you could sort of virtualize the view of the object and, and create create views on the fly that actually were instantiated of the object. Um, so data objects can have service objects associated with it, which define different transformations or views of that content, of the content in the object. And I have a diagram that I hope will make this clear in a minute. But so every object can, can subscribe to a package of behaviors, a set of behaviors, which is one service definition that defines the set of behaviors that this object is capable of doing, and it can be discovered independently, um, which, which it gives you a way to sort of, again, create essentially what I like to think at the simplest level. You're creating a set of virtual data streams, some of which are just stored in physical data streams, and some of which are defined or calculated on the fly, but to the application space, to the front end of the use of the repository, it all looks like data streams. And they can all have different their policies associated with them and um, be usable in all kinds of different ways. And what that means is when you have someone using a repository, they have these are all URLs is what they look like, the calls to a behavior. So you have a package, a set of URLs that you know in advance. Once you discover the PID of the object, you can plug the PID in to all these different URLs to get different views of the object. And that can all be known ahead of time by the repository designer. Um, it's very useful, I think, but it scares a lot of people sometimes. Um, it is a kind of a complex, the way it gets encoded is kind of complex, but Chris Wilfer has made up a nice little utility that makes it easier. Um, and you can, in the getting started with Fedora, you can find that. Um, I'll send you to that at the end. Um, so you can have any number of these packages of behaviors associated with any object. 
And then the, what it means is you've got this virtual view and the business logic of how it's all happening is hidden behind the object. Um, I'll, I've got some, some diagrams here that I hope will make sense of that better. So this, this example is, so I have a, a, an image object and I just use the example, I have a mods file because everybody wants to use mods for everything these days, even though it was designed for text basically. Um, so I have a mods data stream. I have those, the system metadata data streams that I talked about are all in that one little thing in the PID. But, but there's one real content data stream, which is a JPEG 2000 file. And then I have a descriptive metadata data stream about that image. And that's the two real data streams. And so you see on the content management view, the back end view, those data streams, there's two files. There's a mods file and a JPEG 2000 file that are stored and managed in back end store somewhere. Then you have the, the view, the virtual view, say virtual data streams that are, some are created on the fly and some are not just handing back the, the data streams. But so on the left, you have three different sort of metadata views of this object. The one in the middle is just giving back the mods and you just take the data stream contents and string them back to the, when someone asks for the mods, you just give it to them. When someone asks for Dublin Core, it's a transformation. You apply, say, a style sheet, an XSL2 style sheet to the mods file to derive the Dublin Core on demand and hand it back. But to the application, it looks like it's a Dublin Core data stream. Um, and then a citation, so you have a, an XML schema that defines a particular kind of citation information, you can extract that from the mods file and give it back. So say something like Zotero, an application can create a citation and will have all the data it needs. But again, it's created on the fly. And on the image side, so those are all, those methods are all directly associated with the mods data stream. On the image side, the JPEG 2000 can be used to derive all the different sizes of images. And so you have thumbnail, screen size, master size image, and they're all, the master size may just be giving back the JPEG 2000 as a whole, and thumb and screen are transformations. And then you may have a custom size where you can actually give some parameters, say a pixel box that you want the image to fit into, and you can define that as a, as a, a method in a service object that transforms the JPEG 2000 to the user specifications. So, but so the idea is from the content point of view, it looks like it has those seven data streams, but the, they're really only managing the two in the back end. So all the, each, the, the citations say can have a, a policy that anybody can have it. The Dublin Core, um, maybe anybody can have it. Maybe you don't want the whole world to be able to look at your mod file for some reason. That's or just say the master image. You want to restrict that to only the library staff, but the thumb and the screen size are public. Um, or the screen's restricted and the thumb's public, whatever. You can, by doing this, it gives you a way to make those associations that you can't have if you're just applying the policies to the data streams themselves. All right, so here's, here's another example with the image. So that JPEG 2000 example I showed you just now is down or left. The upper left is, say, a general image object a lot of us have done over the years where we have a data stream for the thumbnail say one for a medium size screen resolution, one for a very high resolution, and one for the archival image. And then, like I said before, the JPEG 2000, oops, it says 200 there, typo. Um, the JPEG 2000 file is just one data stream. So in the middle, on the, le on the right, you'll see where it says service definition. That middle rectangle has four methods. Those methods are saying you can get the thumbnail size image, you get the medium size, get the high res, and get the max. Those are metadata that define, normally define what a behavior is going to be. And so then you have the service deployment object for each one. And that says when someone wants to get at the thumbnail um, dissemination, they have to get the thumbnail size image in this way. So the top service deployment has a set of method definitions. And for those, each of the four, it just gets the data stream and hands it back because they're stored directly. In the JPEG 2000, when you say, when you call the object and you say, get me the thumbnail and you give the PID of the JPEG 2000 object, it goes and runs a script against the JPEG 2000 file and, and to hand back the, the um, um, thumbnail. So, but from the user's point of view, they just said, here's the PID, now get me the thumbnail 
and then the object negotiates, goes down and finds its service deployment and figures out how to get it. Um, all right. So one more class of objects, um, and it will bring it all together, I hope. We have content model objects. These um, are a new type of object added to Fedora in version 3.0. Um, the content models are essentially classing mechanisms for a whole class of objects. And so you, you have a content model to express for this class of object that has these, this pattern of data streams, has this number of data streams, the types of the data streams, um, and then the, the content model object actually binds the two service kinds of objects for the disseminators back to the data objects. So when you want, when you're designing your repository, you start out by creating content models for the classes of objects you want. And then as you create data objects, the data objects assert a relationship to the C model object to say, I am a member of that class. And when, if the C model object has behaviors associated with it, then they, the data object inherits those behaviors. So I didn't emphasize this, but the, the whole disseminator architecture of these service objects are all optional. You can have Fedora repositories that don't have any disseminators at all. A lot of people do. But if you have them, they, they operate through the C model. Um, and so it all sort of looks like this. So on the upper left there, you see the C model object. And it has one of its data streams has the chunk of XML that defines the rules for all of the data streams for that class of objects. And then in its RDF data stream, it has the assertions for which service objects are associated with this content model class. So then the data object down below just asserts a relationship to that C model object, and you can get the, the rules about that data object so you can verify in your workflow. You can ideally, the C model objects were defined so that you could build workflows around them so that the workflow can be configured around what data stream types to look for. You can verify as you're going through the workflow that each data object matches that. And then each when you use the object and do the disseminations, it comes back to the C model. So you have that service definition object, which is that high level definition of a set of behaviors from the last example. And that is just method for method, a set of methods, that set of behaviors or views of the object that you can get. And so the C model, in a sense, subscribes to that set of behaviors. And then it has a contract with the service deployment, a particular service deployment object that says, if I want to do those, if my objects in my class want to do this set of behaviors, they have to go and get this other object so they can get the rules of how to do the process. And the, the service deployment objects have web services bound to them in the back. So, so the idea here is that, that then each, each deployment has a contract with a definition object to say, I will faithfully do those, those behaviors for this class of object. So the reason for separating those things is you can have an abstract definition of the set of behaviors, and all kinds of objects, maybe with very, very different kinds of data, may be able to do those same behaviors. Um, and it, the actual call only has, you only have to know the name of the service definition and the method. And so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between methods in the service definition and methods in the, in the service deployment. So there's always a definition of a behavior, and then for a class of objects, the way that the data in that class of objects can be used to carry out that definition. So those are all contained. Those are the four main kinds of objects in Fedora. So next. So okay, this is what when you when you do a service to call call, and we've always called them disseminations. This is what it looks like. You give the PID of the object. There's a whole a URL that you can build, and in the URL, there's a place for the PID of the object. There's a place for the service definition name. So the the name of the package of behaviors plus the name of the method within that package, and that will give you the 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 dissemination without knowing any more about the object. You can also add parameters onto the end of that call. So like I said in the example where you, you have a JPEG 2000 file and you want to pass in, say, 200 pixels and you want the image coming out of the other end to be fit in a 200 pixel box, you can just put a, have a, a, a parameter defined 
that the user has on, on the end. Um, and then you, for versioning, if you want to call an object and get back to a specific version of that of that object, or the, or the data streams assembled the way they looked on a, at a certain time, you can put a date timestamp on the end of the dissemination, and the object, those date, that date time will be interpolated with all the creation dates of the date of the of the um, versions of the data stream, so the right one will show from the right time. Um, it's up to you to make, make sure those those versions are still viable, but, but the Fedora can reassemble the object. So you could pass you could pass the PID of a particular view of an object as part of a citation that actually operates at the time that it was captured and gets back to it. Um, all right. So I talked a little bit about objects representing aggregations already, and I talked about explicit and implicit collections earlier. Um, so this, I have some examples coming up that this is leading up to, so we'll move right along since I really covered this. So here's, this is an example of a project that I personally worked on starting in 1992, and this project is really why I got into Fedora, so I like to use it as an example. Um, Jerry McGann, who was an English professor at University of Virginia back in 1992 when we started the Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities, was very interested in hypertext, and he saw this as a way, <coughs> a new way to do critical editions of the works of a particular um, artist or, or um, writer. And so he was studying Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and he did this project as an, uh, a theoretical model for how these should be done in the future. And when we did this project in 1992, the web wasn't even out there. Um, we weren't aware of the web yet. Um, but it translated to the web directly, and when I discovered Fedora later, the whole architecture was translated very neatly into this complex array of objects. The idea here is there's one object that represents the archive as a whole, and so that is the object that gets connected to the rest of the world. When you discover this new kind of publication, you're discovering that red dot, the object in that red dot. And so it's essentially an object that has some XML in it, that describes the project, who funded it, who participated, you know, all the different dimensions of the project as a whole. And then the way it works is there's a work file, a work object, for every concept that Rossetti was working with. And Rossetti created text. He wrote poems that were about a particular work. The Blessed Damozelle is the classic example. And he wrote different poems that were expressions of that work. He also was a painter, which is why Jerry was so interested in it. He um, painted the concept as well as, as wrote it. The, the artworks were not illustrations of the text. They were complete realizations of the concept. So the work object has XML structured text, all these different essays and commentaries and all these different things about the concept and about each different version of it. All that scholarship is contained at that work level. And their objects, we, we put this in Fedora many years ago, and it worked perfectly. The finished project out there right now is not in Fedora, but it may be eventually. Um, but so then each of those texts, there's an object that represents the text as a whole. He created all of these. It took 15 years. It's, it's 10,000 XML files in this, in this project. But so there's a the text file has a complete transcription of the each text marked up in XML and some metadata about it. And then each of the page images were digitized and they're related back to the text. So each of these are separate objects. And the same with the artwork. There's an XML file that describes the artwork as a work. And then there may be more than one image of the single artwork. So the idea here, I mean, Gary's original idea was that these, these texts and artwork came from dozens, if not over 100, um, different libraries, museums, and ar archives. And his idea was that he wasn't going to, people in the future weren't going to digitize all this stuff. They were going to connect to it. So he, the scholar would create this work level, which then related to the stuff that people are putting out in their repositories. So I can guarantee you almost every one of the repositories that Jerry was digitizing stuff from, which he had to digitize himself, they're now, now madly putting that stuff up there, up to be used by people like Jerry. So if, if they don't start thinking outside their own box of their collection that people are going to reuse it, this is not going to be possible. But so Fedora neatly translates that. I have the text object, like I described earlier, the page image objects, and they, and it all, they all assert relationships. 
So as the Rosetti Archive now is being used by a whole generation of scholars who are doing publishing, they'll be creating new publications that actually link down inside this repository, inside this project, linking up to some of these. So they can assert relationships to these existing objects without recreating them and copying them. So um, here's another example that I'd like to use. This one I made up, but it's based on some, some work I know that's going on in a, just think of this, the idea here is there's a remote sensing project on a coral reef. Um, and so the, the researchers are going out and for several years, they're setting up devices that measure the, uh, the water temperature and the flow and all the different geophysics of the, of the, the coral reef. And then they generate data sets at some regular period. They spit out data back to the central. And they set up a bunch of cameras along the digital cameras along the, uh, the uh, reefs that are taking pictures at, at certain sequences. And so the idea here is all that could be represented in Fedora. The research project would be an object, an, an object that had metadata that talked about the funding and the people involved and the, the basic motivations behind the research project. And then you could have an object for each remote sensing device that had the configuration information. And when the configuration got changed, it would be versioned. So you'd have a history of the remote sensing device. Each, you may have many of those. And then all of the data sets that were generated at certain, say, weekly, say there's a week's worth of data that the data set, each one of those could be data objects. And the remote camera would be spitting out images, and each one of those would be an image object in the repository. And then you have all the publications, like the proposal, the, the grant proposal that got it in the final report. So all of that can be managed and stored as, as one project that's this complex array of objects. But then publishing, people who come along later and want to use it, they can make new objects that are new kinds of publications that assert relationships down inside. The example I always like to use is that one of these images that this project turned up may have a species of fish that no one's ever seen before. And that was completely incidental to this research project, but someone else using it might find it and want to reuse that image. So the way this is, when we, we, we can define with repositories, with Fedora repositories, we can define this complex view of data. But all of these files I'm talking about and all of these objects, they're just flat files sitting out there on the, on the, uh, on the um, server somewhere, on a server somewhere. But they can all be reused and have many relationships to them. So um, let's see. There's one more. All right. And so this is, we haven't really talked about searching yet. Um, I'm sorry, this is probably going on longer than you intended. But so this is the last real slide. So. Um, so the idea here is you have your Fedora repository service, and everything we've been talking about so far is all happening inside that diagram over there on the on the left. Um, and on the on the right, you have a set of services that are designed for repository. So G Search is a generic search. This is a service that can be defined to create different search indexes from different patterns of resources inside the repository. G Search can be defined to be a certain Types of objects, patterns, um, patterns that you use to decide whether an object's part of that that uh, index or not. It can be just grab the data stream content and include it, or it can be grab a dissemination of the object and include it. And then it, it assembles the the search interface. The OAI interface does the same thing for open archives information. Um, it, it can harvest data out of the repository. Um, Fedora comes with a simple JMS service. The, the messaging service that's connected to these, these search services I'm talking about come pre-connected to it. So you create an index and you set up the pattern. G-Search has its, its configuration files. And then every time you add something to the repository that matches that, that uh, pattern, a message is published that G-Search is listening to it. It can incrementally update those indexes. So here's, this is the idea. We're trying to keep the repository service simple and add services that can do different work on top of it. And then the, the messaging is an integral part of all that, so you can set up these things like, like incremental index. Um, so here we go. Here's the, the URL for the Fedora page for the Fedora uh, website, if you haven't found it. If you go to that home page that that, that uh, link links to, you'll see some tabs across the top bar. The Getting Started tab is like a summary of 
kinds of things I've been telling you. And then it gives you links down in down into the documentation so you can have a more structured way of getting into the documentation. There's a whole variety of stuff out there. There's a there's also a web instance, I mean a cloud based instance of Fedora out there that you can start up and play with without having to worry about configuration. You just if you go down that list you'll see it. It's pretty obvious. The software tab is the entry point for the all the software developers around Fedora. And so when you go there, you'll see that it's broken into two groups. The repository service is the core software documentation that the developers are doing, that the committers group is doing. That's that core service that was in that diagram on the left last time. And then Fedora Create is, is an area that's a wiki that's all about where people can register other software they've written to use with Fedora. So there's all kinds of libraries and applications and different kinds of workflow uh, components and things out there. So that's been created in the last year and it's still growing. So that's all I have. I'm sorry I went on so long. Once I get started, I just go. Um, Carissa, are you still there? I think I think uh, I am you're all. Yeah. So I just um, I think it's I think anybody that wants to ask a question, if you just unmute yourself and ask it, I think I'll hear it, and everyone else will too. So I'm happy to try to answer questions. I haven't. Put everyone to sleep. Any questions? Okay. If there are no questions. Did I hear someone? I can't. No. I'm hearing myself echo. Uh, yes, I have a question here. Okay. Uh, Fedora does not have a format registry like DSpace does. Um, what do you use for ensuring the preservation of the files? It, it assumes that you're going to have a registry of some sort. You can build one in Fedora with objects. That's what some people have done. Um, the idea is that it would link to existing registries as they came available. You'll find that there are a lot of those kinds of things that, from the Fedora point of view, are considered part of the application space. Um, in the in the preservation sense, it's uh, it is uh, it does seem that it's not really part of the application, but it does seem also that it belongs to be in some community shared place that is not part of the software too. So that's the approach we took. Any other questions? Okay. There are no other questions. Uh, if not, someone I see something written there. What APIs are available? For, uh, um, Fedora has a, a, a management API and an application. I mean, I think we were. We're changing. Fedora has a set of its own APIs that are all the different can make to objects, um, and those can be exposed in different ways. I know we've got a REST API and a SOAP API right now. Um, I think as of the 3.4, the REST API was considered completely ready for prime time and complete as far as the functions of Fedora are concerned. The SOAP API was always complete. Um, there are also uh, in the, you can, um, let's see, I don't remember other than that. You'll have to take a look at the documentation. But there are the, the core APIs that Fedora provides are the REST API and the SOAP API. Any other questions? If not, I guess we'll end it. Thanks a lot for listening in. I hope it was useful. I'm Thorny Staples. I'm the Director of Community Strategy and Alliances at DuraSpace and Director of the Fedora Project. I've been involved with Fedora for a very long time now, it seems. Um, Sandy Payette developed the Fedora architecture as part of a research project and published her first paper in 1998. 
I found that paper in 1999, got interested. I was doing digital library work at the University of Virginia. I contacted her, we got to be friends, and eventually we got a series of grants and created the Fedora software and then created the DuraSpace company, merging with the DSpace people last year. Um, and that's what brings us to where we are today. Um, I'm, this, this presentation is not intended to be a complete, in-depth, ultimate, all the details of Fedora kind of presentation. It's really intended to give people some the basics of, of what you need to understand Fedora to get started and to start looking more closely at the documentation. Um, so I'll, uh, that's the, the basic pitch here. Um, if, you, if, if you have a question about something I've said, it's not clear, please don't hesitate to speak up and ask. But if you've got a question that's more general, save it to the end, and I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, so we'll get started. Um, Fedora actually means something. It stands for the Flexible Extensible Digital Object Repository Architecture. And I think the basic way I look at it is a set of abstractions that can be used to represent different kinds of data for lots of different kinds of purposes. Um, the Fedora software that DuraSpace manages that we, you know, have, we um, are the catalyst for now. We have a community development process. But um, it is a complete repository management system but it's not a complete information management system for your favorite use case. It, it gives you, the, essentially, it's a really powerful foundation for a whole variety of information management applications. And the basic purpose, uh, the basic thrust behind all of our development in years has been to make software a repository that can be used to make data durable over the long term. We tend to use the term durable these days um, rather than talking about preservation because we, we think it means keeping preservation and access. And we think that's a very important thing. So a lot of what I'll be telling you about is um, the, the characteristics of Fedora that were built into and designed to do that. Fedora can be used for purposes that aren't so durable. You can have all kinds of information management schemes that you may not care so much about long-term uh, management of the data. But it is the basic thrust of everything we've done is, is aimed at that, that use case. Uh, that general, very general use case. Um, so, I mean, making complex digital information durable is a really hard problem. When I say complex digital information, we tend to look at, at digital information as being developing, developing along a trajectory where we're going to have the World Wide Web of formally defined content, meaning digital objects that have lots of relationships to other digital objects. And the real meaning of the digital information, the purpose of it, will be much more about putting things together and, and very complex arrays of information that must be uh, maintained and managed over time. So part of the problem is assuring the fidelity of the information, and that's standing behind the existence and the meaning of the content, that you have to verify that the bits are still the same bits that were put in. But that's only true until you start migrating data, which we already are doing and we will be doing lots more of migrating to new formats, migrating to, you know, higher resolutions, uh, re, you know, rescanning, that kind of thing. So the idea is it's keeping both the fidelity and the authenticity of the information as stable as possible over time. So there's a, a part of repository management of digital information that's about that authenticity question. It's about being able to say that this content is logically the same content that it was even if all the bits are changed. And where the bits haven't changed, you can prove the bits haven't changed. So a lot of that has storing metadata about the events that are happening to the data. Fedora gives you ways to do both things built in, and we'll look at that more in a moment. Um, another important thing here is that when you're talking about complex information, the context of it, the, the relationships it has to other digital information is critical. And so it's not a simple matter of just having a bunch of relatively simple digital objects and keeping them in a line. It gets much more complex than that. So having the flexibility to represent very complex arrays of objects that have all kinds of different relationships and more than one relationship, many relationships in some cases, is, is really critical to the, what we're building on the web, I believe. Um, so and increasingly, these complex resources will not be in a single repository. So if you are designing your repository with the idea that it's a closed 
repository that as long as you have all your objects under your control and you do nice things with them, you're okay. I think that's not going to go very far because a big part of the purpose of putting things in repositories is so people can use them, and people don't care which repository they're in. They want to go out and find things and put them together in new ways, create new scholarly, scientific, and all kinds of other materials. So having a, a system that's ready for that is a big part of what the whole Fedora project has been about since the beginning. And that's one reason we took the approach that we did. Um, so I think it's, it's safe to say, as I said in the beginning, the four Fedora abstract it's a set of abstractions about digital data that you can use to build this durability framework. So the basic idea is that content is unitized as objects, information objects, that combine the data and metadata policies about how the data and metadata can be used, relationships of that ob the object in, in, your, in question to other objects, and then all of the information about the history of the object, the, the metadata about the events, what we think of as preservation metadata. All of that is stored in an object where all the metadata about the content, all the different components of the content are in one object that then can have relationships to other ones. So then these complex digital relationships are all stored as objects that can have relationships asserted and you can, you can from any given object, you can travel the, the graph of relationships to, to use the, the complex information. Um, so Fedora provides two, really two kinds of abstractions. One abstraction is sort of the, what I like to think of as the front-facing abstraction, which is an, the view towards the application space, that this is how the content looks with all its complexity. And then there's the back end sort of abstraction, which makes all of, the, all of the, the content look like a bunch of files. That's one of the really elegant things about Fedora. It's designed to be able to manage data as if it's just a bunch of files, black files in an array. Um, that then when you start using them, they start looking like a graph, a very complex graph related on it. So Fedora is like the, the um, software in the middle that sort of breaks the connection between those two sets of abstractions or maintains the connection between those two sets of abstractions. And, and Fedora is completely web services oriented, and that's part of um, was designed from the very beginning in Sandy and Carl's research. Carl Lugosi worked with it on Sandy in the beginning. Um, that was designed around the idea of, of federating repositories. So it was these, this idea that repositories were going to be sharing data, people were going to be using data across repositories was there from the beginning. And it's, but it's going to become more and more critical. Um, this picture is, is designed